All right, so let's talk about changing brokerages, how to choose a brokerage, how to choose a team, when to leave a team, all these different questions I think that come up all the time. And I wanna uh, take this time in this conversation in this podcast episode to answer all these questions that agents have. What are the most important things? What should I ask? What should I be looking for? And I think that uh, that's exactly what we're gonna do in today's video. So I wanna just tee this up with one piece of context that I think matters a lot with this conversation. And that is everything we're gonna talk about is with the one goal of selling houses. So we're not talking about all the other things that are uh, coming up in the industry right now with like recruiting agents and earning rev share and all this other stuff. We're not talking about building a team. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about a real estate sales professional selling houses, succeeding through selling houses. That's the context under this conversation because I could just hear people saying, well, all these other companies are offering all these other incentives. I understand that's a different conversation for a different person. This conversation is for the agent who is in this business to do what it was intended to do, which is the helping of people buying and selling real estate as a service and getting your compensation through that channel. Is that fair, gentlemen? Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. All right, so there's multiple different um topics when it comes to this. And the first one I'm going to start off with is the idea around a company or a team being agent centric versus it being broker centric. What I mean by that is this. Number one, are you, do you have the ability to build your own brand identity versus the company's brand? So this is becoming more and more apparent um, and true that the consumer is doing business with the agent, not with the brokerage. I think most people would agree with that concept, yet there are companies out there that are still very, very heavily broker-centric and not agent-centric, meaning you cannot build your own brand. You, you must be under these branding guidelines in order for you to be compliant with some of the, I would say, older brands out there. So for me, it's the first question. Do I have the ability to build my own brand identity or not either way is fine but this is the first question you guys have any thoughts on that first point yeah i think it's it's evolved into like a team ridge is kind of what they're calling it right where it's, it's basically a giant team that is a brokerage or like some of these bigger brands where they really want you to follow a process and it, it does end up being more it can be really good for a lot of people because it has a lot of structure so you just have to decide going into that if you need that or not. Well, let, let me give you even more, uh, a really, I guess, the basic example of what I'm talking about. A broker-centric model, and I'll just leave companies out of it. I don't want it to be, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm just saying there are brokerages out there that when you list a house, you cannot put your own number on there. Yeah, It's only the office number. Well, why do they want that? It behooves the broker. It's a broker-centric model so they can generate leads for floor time. That's what I'm talking about. get more about. agents to come to their brokerage because they yes. can promise leads. So it makes sense why broker-centric models do this, right? So uh, another one is, okay, going back to the listing sign. You can't put your name on the sign. It's mm -hmm. going to be company name, company number, if you list a home at our company, period. And so they want their brand, they're building their brand. It behooves them to do that. I get it. And they want the sign calls. That's what I mean by broker centric, agent centric. Dominic, you have any thoughts on that really quick? Because that's this yep. is an easy yep. point, but I think it's important. It's an easy point. And I will just say one thing. When when you are talking to a prospect, somebody to potentially do business with, they are hiring you. Your, you and the, the brand that comes attached to you. And if you are attached to one of these brands, big brands, like what you're talking about, there may in the future be a feeling of, yeah, we hired a, you know, a brand X agent as opposed to, yeah, we hired, uh, um, you know, Ben Riles to handle our transaction. Then if brand Ben chooses to leave brokerage X, Ben's brand and everything goes with him and he looks the same, feels the same, sounds the same, wherever he decides to plant himself as opposed to attaching himself to a big uh, national brand X type brand. That's what I would say. They're hiring you, not the brokerage. That's right. And your book of business should follow you. All right. So now under that same point, agent, uh, agent centric versus broker centric is, do you have the freedom 
to run your business the way that you want. Well, what do I mean specifically? Well, one of the big ones, this is probably one of my biggest um, challenges or my biggest frustrations with brokers in general is the way in which agents charge for their services. For years, my whole career, this is probably most of the amount of like back and forth arguments I've had with broker owners is like, to be able to come up with a compensation structure that the agent gets to decide versus being told what they should do or what they should what they can or cannot charge. This is one of my biggest gripes in the industry. Well, now because of these commission lawsuits, brokers, you don't have a choice anymore, right? That's kind of the, the path we're going down that commissions are in fact negotiable. But for years, for years, I would deal with brokerages that say, no, 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 you can't charge this. This is what you must charge. And that's what the whole commission lawsuits are all about, is that mentality. So an agent-centric business model that says, you are in business for yourself, okay? We're brokering your deals. You are in uh, business for yourself. Come up with a model that makes sense for you, right? And so th the ability for brokers to, uh, to get in the way of that, I think is going away more so um, but I think it's important that before you get into business with somebody that you find out, do you have the freedom to have a compensation structure that makes sense? Do you have the freedom to have an incentive or an offer that you can make to the, uh, to the market that makes sense? As an example, can you go to a large corporation in your local market and offer to be a part of their employee benefit package because you offer a special real estate incentive offer? Or is your broker gonna say, no, 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 we're rigid. You can't do that. You see on line 17 of the contract, it says right here, you must charge 6%. You must do six month contract. You must do this, you must do that. You cannot do, see all the red tape? You can't do that, it's in the rule book. So do you have any freedom or flexibility would be the second point that I'd find out up front before you start to switch brokerages and go through all of that. Ben, your thoughts on that? When you're running a business and, and doing exactly what you're talking about, there is no like black and white, right? When you're making a business decision and the deal is massive, the percentage shouldn't matter. Like it should be a, a, a bottom line decision and if the percentage equals something different and it's smart and good and healthy for your business, yeah, you should have the ability to have some gray wiggle room and make a good decision. Yeah, because my argument to every broker that would ever listen to this show or ever is this. You see, well, there's two arguments. One, I would say, well, do you have any issue with your agent charging more? That's In other right. words, if you're, if you're a broker and you say, well, we... Our brokerage, you cannot charge less than 5%. I don't care. Doesn't matter. You can't do it. Okay, great. Can I charge 9%? Oh, yeah, that's not a problem. So so that, to me, is, is just opening up the can. Tons of legal issues, right? So it's like, wait a minute. How, how does that even make any sense? Legally, morally, ethically? Uh, you're talking about following these code of ethics. Right. When it's only in your benefit, you're saying. When it's only in your benefit, we'll be morally uh, uh, sound. But if it doesn't benefit us, then we're not going to do that. To me, that's not a good code of ethics, number one, right? Uh, and, then, and then number two, which I can't remember now, was as important. But Dominic, your thoughts on that while I try to figure this out? Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I think it's uh, because we are entrepreneurs and we, we need the yeah. option and the ability to be flexible when it comes to making these deals because everybody's personal situation, the, the customers and clients that we deal with, they're all different. So how can we stuff all those people into one sized hole that the brokerage says, hey, this is how they have to be managed. And the, and the other leg to that is, geez, how many times a week do we get the question in coaching? Well, my, my, my brokerage won't let me say X, Y, Z. And I've got that in my advertising, but they won't let me, they won't let me offer that. What do I do? Every day. Yeah. So the second thing I was going to say is like a simple math problem. So one is what I just said, right? So like, how can you argue you can't do less, but you can do more and be morally uh, sound? And then what about just a math problem? If, if a brokerage's average commission was $7,000 in GCI and an agent were, to, to Ben's point, was going to go secure a deal that was going to bring in to the, to the company $50,000 of gross commission income, 
Would it matter what the percentage was? Like if, if broker, I didn't tell you what I charge and I said, hey, I've got this one deal uh, and it's, you know, I'm going to get $7,800 on it and, um, you know, it's a 6% commission. Broker would be like, yeah, awesome job. Cool. And then I came back the next day and say, broker, Bob, I got some good, I, I got, I got some, some good news. I just closed the deal and the gross commission income on it was 47,000. He'd be like, dude, that's amazing. But I charged a half a percent to get yeah. it. <laughs> Wait, what did you do? You know what I mean? It's like, dude, you, you just, it's, it's like, it's just like emotion versus logic versus ego versus like entrepreneurship, making good sound business decisions. You know, how can you make that argument? If, if I sell, and I don't want to make this about this, right? I'm not, I don't want to make this about this. But if you were able to help somebody buy a $4 million home, you know, and you get a $40,000 commission because you got 1% or you sold a $200,000 home and you got 10% and made 20, what is the difference? Tell me, I mean, what am I missing? Dominic, what am I missing? Nope. I just can't see what you're missing. Yeah. It's double the revenue. And so we just get caught up in these percentages. Anyway, those days are limited. Uh, and it just took massive class action lawsuits to bring this to the forefront. But these brokers with these rigid corporate bureaucratic viewpoints on this, I think are, are limited. All right, let's move on to the next point. So that's agent centric, broker centric. You want to, my opinion, make sure you're with a company that that is an agent centric uh, culture. All right. Now, another one that I think that is not often uh, talked about, which is what is the team or the brokerages listing inventory? I've been having lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with the agents that we coach, and I'm saying, listen, we had better ask what their listing inventory is, and here's why. For most agents, the ability to leverage these listings to get more listings is so valuable. In other words, if you're with a team or a brokerage that has hundreds and hundreds of listings scattered throughout the marketplace that you can do your open house events on, you could do prospecting and marketing around these listings to secure more business would be amazing versus being at a company that is broker centric and says, no, no, you can't market any of our listings. But it's like, wait a minute, don't you want me to bring a buyer for all these listings? You want me to co-op and bring you the buyer. What's the difference between that and me marketing uh, uh, the listing in general, right? Just another rigid belief. So I wanna find out, does this company, does this team have a large listing inventory? Yes or no, right? Do they have market share? And then if they do, can I leverage that market share to generate more opportunities? And I think this is a really good question to ask because a lot of these teams, it's like, well, we don't have any listings. You have zero listings? Yeah, we just do all buy side transactions or, or whatever. I think it's really important. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've got, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I agree, agree 100%. Okay, so that one's simple. Yep. So um, along the lines with market share, the other reason why I want to ask this is you, again, I just, I'm under the belief that you should be with, an, with a company that has some decent market share. Um, and if they have that, are, can you use those company results as a part of your marketing? Can you use that as a part of your resume? Can you use that as a part of your approach to win more business? Can you leverage the company uh, in a way that helps you secure and give your consumer more confidence in hiring you. So that's the other piece when it comes to market share that I think is really, really important. Um, and I do want to touch on this brand thing, right? So when it comes to market share, like being with the big company versus the small company, having a brand name, not having brand name, I believe that it has pros and cons. So like the upside to being with a, call it a Remax, like that certainly can help you. You know what I mean? You could just say the name and it gives you instant credibility perception wise in the consumer's mind. Like, oh, I've heard of that. Okay. So versus I'm with, you know, Billy Bob's real estate. Oh, I've never heard of that. Okay. I'm not hanging my hat on that though. Right. I mean, I left a big brand to be an independent because it can also hurt you to be with a big brand. Meaning this, you call an expired listing and you say you're with a big company and regardless of what you say next, if they had a bad experience with an agent at company X, they say, oh no, we will never do business with them, right? And it's like, now you're fighting this uphill battle. It's like all agents are different. They don't hear that. They don't hear that. They just heard the company's name, 
that rub them the wrong way. And now to that person, uh, it's going to be hard for you to ever do business with them. So there's pros and cons, right? In a perfect world, I think that you would you would want to have a brand that gave you some credibility and um, that gave you some confidence. But at the end of the day, the consumer's hiring you, right? And so it's up to you to distill this confidence, regardless of what it says on your name badge. Dom, I know you've got some thoughts on that, but that's the way I see brand. It can help and it can hurt. Yep, I agree. And I, I also moved from a large national brand to a local boutique brand that has a more of a presence in my town. But if you, <laughs> we, we, I've made thousands and thousands of phone calls and nobody has ever said, oh, you're with Brand X? Just don't say anymore. Come on over and list my property. I'm glad you called. Yeah. It's never like that. They're hiring you. And most of the time they go, who, who did you say you're with? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. No, that's a really good point. And I think a lot of these companies that I would call still are broker centric are hanging their hat on like, hey, come here and pay us a lot of money because of that. It's going to help you get more business. I think there's just no truth or reality to that whatsoever. Agree. Yeah. All right. So now let's just make sure we're re re recap. We talked a lot about uh, agent centric versus broker centric. We talked about listing inventory. We talked about market share. Now let's talk about the next, uh, the next point. I bet you most of the people are like, well, what about commission split? It's always their first question. It shouldn't be. And I'm going to explain to everybody why in just a second. Let's talk about lead generation support. Okay. So, um, the question we've got to ask is what type of support does the team or the brokerage offer? when it comes to client acquisition, right? I mean, this is what it's really about. And I think this is probably the biggest gripe agents would have with a lot of the, the different brokerages out there is they're not getting the support to get new clients. So this is a really important conversation to have with the potential broker or team leader is what type of support, if any, are you offering to help me actually get clients? Like put everything else aside, what are you doing there to help me? Are you helping me generate the lead? Are you helping me to convert the lead? Maybe with an ISA department? What are you doing to help me generate clients? And this is probably the question that brokers hope they don't get, right? We talk about sales and sales training and dealing in tough conversations. This is the one the broker hopes they don't get because most don't do anything. I think teams do a really nice job of this, but most brokerages aren't going to do much. I haven't seen it to generate and, and, and acquire clients. Ben, have you seen that? Yeah, I, I think a couple obviously out there that, yeah. that do, that have a really big, you know, maybe hang their hat on luxury or this or their their network across. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it used to come down to, like we talked a little earlier, floor time, right? Or having a little bit of that recognition that people are coming in. But I think we've evolved away from it because people aren't relying as much on the brand for the information. And with some of these bigger tech type of companies and search platforms, they're not calling the broker direct. But um, yeah, I mean, their web presence would be a big one that they've leaned their hat on, I would say, in the past. Yeah, yeah. And the presence thing is another vague thing, right? And, right. and so this is where I think teams provide a lot of value to the marketplace because some agents can get into a team environment where they don't have to worry about lead generation. I mean, that's a huge thing to walk into and not have to worry about lead generation. Like, wow. I mean, that's a massive part of the business that a lot of teams solve. It's a big problem in the business. Teams, their value to agents is we've solved the biggest problem. You come into our team, we're going to supply you with 30 leads a month. It's just enough business to get you a closing or two a month. And that's a big, big, big value add to a lot of agents. Dominic, you have any thoughts on lead generation? I have a lot, I have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts, but yeah, I, I agree. Like how, how are they, are they going to provide a platform for you to work from to generate your own leads? Or are they just going to give you a lead? Hey, this lead called, here it is. They're pre-scrubbed. What is the, yeah, what's the condition of the leads when they show up? Are they just ready to go? You go open some doors or you go sit and have a listing consultation. I mean, all of these things matter. Obviously, we come from a world where uh, we, we would just want a platform. If I was on a team, I'd say I would want them to give me the platform, teach me how to do it, 
and I would just go out and do it uh, with the intensity that I see fit for my business. Yeah. And a lot of people can't do it on their own, right? So therefore, it's, it's, uh, it's, which we're going to talk about compensation in just a second and, and, and how to balance that and how to figure out what compensation structure makes the most sense based on some of the things we're talking about uh, prior to. So the next thing then is, okay, how are they going to support you in generating opportunities? The next one is once you have an opportunity or you've secured a client, what type of support do they help you while you have the client and you're now delivering the service that the person hired you to do? We're talking specifically about what type of listing marketing are they helping with? What type of listing coordination are they helping with? And what type of uh, client or transaction or closing coordination are they helping with? And so this would be the next thing I'm going to ask. You know, what if I get a listing, how are you, the brokerage, going to help me to promote and to market my listing? What is it that you guys do? Are you helping me to manage the client experience at all? When I get an offer, are you going to help me with the closing process? Or is this just all, am I just all on my own? So that's another huge, massive thing to consider that I think, generally speaking, teams do a much better job of than your traditional brokerages. So I think most agents are doing this work on their own. But I'm curious, have you guys uh, seen this differently? Or, or with uh, how do you see the client experience as it relates to picking the right company? Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking probably a step ahead too, so I'm trying to reel it back. But, um, you know, it, it's what's going to help you create some leverage long term, right? And really get, you know, some traction to get your next couple deals, right? So we got to be make sure that that we have the tools to do that if it's not going to be provided by the brokerage on our own. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and, and Dom, I'm gonna get your thoughts in a second. But yeah, that just brings kind of like the same point, which is tools and resources, right? What types of tools and resources are being offered versus what do you have to go out there and invest your own dollars into? What's being provided versus what do I have to go out there and come out of pocket uh, in order to be successful? Dominic, your thoughts on, on these two points? Yep, yep. So when it comes to this entire point, the thing I wrote down was what a team or or a good brokerage would offer are repeatable systems and processes. So every single time you take a listing, the same exact thing happens to every single listing. And if you're at a, at a well-structured team, they have that in place from the time you meet with the per or from the time you're pulling the comps till the time you're meeting with the people, the signed contract, the sign goes in the yard the same exact way. The same photographer takes the photos, same staging company. That way, it just takes away some of the brain work that is necessary. And after closing, what happens to a client? Well, a killer team has got a process that starts at the closing table. That's right. right. Are, how are we going to continue to nurture this relationship in the future? It's the same. You don't have to go, oh, God, I remember we closed so-and-so uh, 17 months ago. It's, it's almost time for their two-year anniversary. I better send them a note. It's all in a process. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the next point. Let's talk about broker support. So this is another big one. And, and there's a debate be, 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 uh, behind, do I go to a company or a team that has a producing team leader or a producing broker versus a non-producing team leader, non-producing broker? And so uh, you can go either way with this. My, my belief is that having somebody who is in the trenches, who is walking the walk, doing the doing, uh, someone who is in production, who's been successful in the process of helping people buy and sell real estate is, is better for the agent versus having a manager type person who has never succeeded in the business of selling real estate be the person who's supporting me in my business. What is your guys' opinion on this? Diamond, let me go to you first. Yeah, a thousand percent, man. I want I want somebody who is either currently doing it or uh, or has done it at a high level because that's the difference between you know re reading a textbook to learn how to do something and being taught by somebody who is currently doing it or has done it. This is a tremendous difference between theory and application. 
Yeah, that's right. It goes right back to agent centric versus broker centric. You got the manager in there with the $50,000 salary who's like supporting you, who never has succeeded in the business of real estate sales. They're just literally reading a, a handbook that they were given by the broker owner on what you can and you can't do. And it's just as simple as that. And so when it comes to, you know, navigating deals and helping you get things to the closing table and, and navigating issues that arise in a transaction. I mean, I can tell you the difference between having a great broker who's in the trenches who can help work, work through these things is so valuable versus someone with no transactional experience. It's very difficult. Ben, have you had that experience? Some of my favorite companies that are just, you know, in our marketplace are companies that place a CEO at the top only by rising through the trenches and mm. starting at the bottom. They drove the forklift, they worked in the warehouse, they worked as the you know desk person, then the manager, president, and they worked their way up. And I think that unless you do that, you just don't have that same perspective and feel and interaction with the people on the team and at the company, unless you've been through that. It doesn't have to be that way every time, but that's just my feeling you know, working side by side with a broker is it's a better experience when they've been there, done it and at a high level. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about another point that Dominic brought up a little bit earlier, but and, and I think that it's not um, brought up enough, which is office presence. And I want to give you a couple of different perspectives on this. Right. So I, I, I like if I had to choose, if I had to choose, I would much prefer to be at a company that has a great office presence scattered throughout the market in which I sell real estate in. Why? Because I'm telling you, the, the perception does matter in the consumer's mind. And so like to be able to leverage the fact of like, oh yeah, I know your office is at. It's right down there on Main Street next to so-and-so. It's more of a staple in that community. I would rather have that versus, hey, where where's your office at? And you have to come up with some, well, we don't have an office, you know, like, or, you know, whatever the other answer may be. I would prefer if I had to, the choice to, ha to be at a company where you've you've got market presence in these communities throughout the bigger market area, if I had the choice, um, you two I both. I mean, Ben, you've sold real estate in, in a couple different states. So, what would you prefer? I, I think you just have to ask yourself. Like, if I was talking, if I was going to hire somebody to do something important outside of real estate, like an attorney, you know there's attorneys that work out of their home and there's attorneys that have an office. And if I, if you were to call somebody, how would you feel if they were like, yeah, I'm at my, I'm working from my house. That's where my office is. We can meet at Starbucks. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're comfortable with that, great. If not, and maybe you require a higher level of professionalism and office or whatnot, it might be, then maybe that that's a better fit for you going into the marketplace. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's great. And Donna, before you get your thoughts, that's a really good point, Ben, you brought up. And it's like, um, cause I could just hear people in the comments like, oh, you know, I, no one ever goes to the office anymore. And blah. I get it from the agent's perspective. We're talking Correct. about from the consumer's <clears throat> perception, real or not, valuable or not. I'm just saying if you had option A and you had an office location on every downtown corner of your market versus none, it's hard to argue you would prefer to have none versus right. having an offense presence for the perception of the consumer. We're not talking about what's good for you as the agent, whether you go in, work from home, work. we're not talking about that. We're talking about what's gonna help you win the business. It's a question you have to ask. That's all, it's a question you have to ask. Dominic, what are your thoughts on office presence? Yep, I listen, if, if you're gonna go that direction and you're not gonna be with one of these, you know, strictly online type brokerages, if you're going to go to a brokerage that has office presence, it should be, uh, I mean, from my perspective, the reason I am where I am, one of the reasons is the office should be a place that you can feel good about bringing a client that presents a, I wanted to say a professional atmosphere, but uh, an impressive atmosphere because when when I bring people to the office where I work, I mean, it is a very, very nice quality, luxury feeling building. And when somebody comes in there, they are doing this, right? They're like, wow, yeah, it's there, there's, there's, there's impact there and it's intangible. You couldn't put a dollar uh, value on that, but uh, there is value to that for sure. You're, it, yeah. I'll just end it with that. 
Yeah. And so again, we're not talking about, you know, I think a lot of, again, I can just hear people in the comments like, no, no, I love my virtual brokerage and all this. That's from your perspective. That's your agent view. That's a different conversation. We're talking about uh, the consumer's perspective. All right. So now let's now talk about commission. All right. So literally before this episode, I, if you just Google, Hey, how to choose the right brokerage, you're going to get a bunch of different blogs that, sh that pop up. And on every one I read this morning, it was all their number one thing. Like find out the split, the split, the split, the split, the split. No wonder agents first thing is split. Here's my argument to that. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. All right. Let me give you a couple examples. So if I were to say to agent A, who's so fixated on a broker split, and I just say, yeah, this company has a 50-50 split and this company has 100% commission. You get, you get all of it. You don't give them any of the money. My fear is that the vast majority would just say, well, geez, more is better. I would rather just, I don't want to keep up half my money. That's only half the story. What I mean by that is this, let me paint this picture. What if you could go to a company and I'll, and I'll present it both ways. What if you can go to a company on a 50, 50 split and they do all of your prospecting, all of your lead generation, all of your listing marketing, all of your listing coordination, all of your transaction coordination, all you had to do is show up at a listing appointment, take the listing, show up at closing and get paid. And as a result, you were able to generate $400,000 in GCI that you split and you ended up with a $200,000 income. You didn't have to work nights. You didn't have to work weekends. You didn't have to worry about client services, blowing up your phone every night, all weekend. That could happen. And people succeed under that model all the time versus you going to the company and you get to keep all your money, but you have to do it all yourself. You got to generate all your own business. You have to do it all on yourself. You got to market. You got to do the client service, the lead generation, the lead conversion. You have to do it all. And what, what do we know about agents in that model? The average agent in that model does six deals a year and they make 40 grand a year. So I would ask you under those, that example, what would be better for you giving up half your commission and earning 200K or keeping all your commission and earning 40K? Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Now, there's the opposite of that. What if you're the type of agent who can do all of that? Who can generate their own business? Who does have the systems and the processes in their own business to convert leads, give a great client experience, follow up with people, handle the marketing all for themselves? Does it make sense for them to give up half their money or 10% or 20% or 30% of their money to a team or a company when they're doing it all on their own anyways? Well, absolutely not. So before you say, okay, I'm going to make my decision uh, uh, purely on a commission split. That's why I presented it the way that we presented today. The question you have to ask yourself before is, can you go out there and generate business on your own? Can you go out there and convert those leads into appointments? Do you have a compelling presentation to convert those appointments into actual clients? Do you have a client fulfillment system that allows you to take a new client get them all the way to the closing table without any hiccups? Do you have the tools, the resources? Can you navigate transactions on your own without having to have your hand held? These are the questions you have to ask first before you find out what compensation structure is offered. Because compensation is a direct reflection of these answers, uh, the, uh, the answers to these questions. So that's the way I look at compensation. Dominic, how do you look at compensation? Yeah, I, I, I would, yeah exactly the same way that you said, you said one thing and, and I want to add a little bit to that. And you said, can, can you go out and do these things on your own? I would suggest that a lot of people can do it. The real question is, will you do it? Great point. Will you go out and will you get up every day and make 30 contacts a day? Will you follow up? Will you create the processes? Will you do those things regularly as regularly as you would do them as if, the same as if you joined a team and they expect you to be in the office. If, I'm sure you're going to talk about office environment, but will you? would you do it the same way you would as if you knew you had to, when you got your lead, you had to make a phone call and it's being tracked and measured by somebody else. They can see that you made that phone call. They can see that you sent that email. They can see that you showed those houses and you are being held accountable to somebody else. I mean, there's, most people need that level of outside accountability. 
hundred percent. Yeah. And environment probably is the, the thing that will do more than anything else we talked about on this show than anything else. Being in a good, positive, productive environment will do more for somebody than anything else. And so, especially for the agent that's just getting started, he or she's much better off being in an office environment or being in a team environment where it's exactly what Dominic just outlined versus just being by yourself from day one. That's not going to end very well. And I've seen it all too often, you know. Uh, ben, your thoughts on commission splits and compensation structures? I, I think of it as. Um just boiling it down to what is a broker actually there to do. And it's like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's compliance and to hold your license, right? And then just deciding from there, it's like, what else do I need? And then finding out, creating that list, going through this checklist of these points that we've made, and then determining what you need and just finding the best fit. Because I think the biggest frustration that comes our agents are at a brokerage that's servicing a different type of agent than you are. And if you're at a, a brokerage that doesn't give you leads and maybe you keep more commission and that might be a frustrating environment for you, right? But if you're at a brokerage that is the opposite, then you can thrive, right? So, and be happy and be completely content. So just being aware of what you actually need and then what would you pay for on your own versus it coming out of the broker and not even having to think about it and just paying it through a split. So just be honest with yourself. And, and then it's a lot easier to justify a 50% split or a cap or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you brought up something interesting. And I think this is a really good point to uh, kind of wrap this whole thing up is like, I don't, I don't believe that an agent is going to succeed because of the team or the brokerage, that the person's going to succeed under any circumstance. It isn't the, because I think that's the biggest thing in my conversations with people is they're putting such a heavy emphasis. I'm not where I want to be because of broker X. So I'm going to go to broker Y. And because of that, I'm now going to be successful. They're, they're putting so much into that where the real responsibility is with themselves and the broker is not going to save you. That's right. Is it going to be better here and there? Yeah, it could be. It could be. But you're not going to go from doing four deals to 45 deals automatically. It's going to be because of you. It's going to be because of your character, your work ethic, your ability to get up every day and do the work. Changing companies, bouncing around 17 different companies a year isn't, and that's what a lot of agents do. They're like the broker hoppers, right? They just keep changing companies, changing companies, changing companies. And that's their way of creative avoidance of like, ah, oh, I don't have to worry about doing the work because I get to make all these new signs and new logos and new colors, new office. And they get really excited about all the change all the time. And I just don't think uh, agents should have the mindset of like, I will succeed based on the company. I'm going to succeed no matter what company I'm with. And I just need to align with a company who believes in what I believe in, who supports me based on what Ben just said with what I need. And I'm going to succeed no matter what. That's got to be the mindset. If you're getting into this business as an entrepreneur, self-employed person with an employee mindset that the broker is going to be the one that's going to help you succeed, it's not the business for you. Simple. It's not the business for you. If that's what you want, you need to stay as a W-2 employee somewhere else. You're coming into this to be your own business owner. It's called self-employment. So don't look to the broker to be your savior and to help you, and they're there to support you, not the reason why you're going to see uh, succeed or not.